In this video, I would like to do system identification considering some constraints and also a little bit of pre-knowledge to show you the benefits of implementing pre-knowledge directly in the system identification process. For this, we will work with this electric circuit here on the right. Um, this electric circuit is basically a passive circuit. We have uh, three capacitor, uh, two capacitors, um, no, two inductors, one capacitor and three resistors. And we will assume that this circuit is basically fed by a constant voltage source that would be like our input signal. And we consider that we only have one measurement. And the single measurement what we have is that we know the current flowing into the circuit itself, which is this input current I1. And we assume that based on our knowledge, which we basically have here at the terminals of the circuit, that we want to identify the parameters within the circuit. So we assume that we have like structural pre-knowledge as usual for parameter identification. So we know that the circuit in general is built up in this way, but we do not know the parameter values of the three resistors, the two inductors and the one capacitor. However, the picture is also a little bit more difficult in comparison to our previous applications because now we have only one um, one out of three states measurements because the state uh, of this inductor is basically the input current, so this is what we can measure, while we do not have direct access to the state of the capacitor and the state of the inductor. Okay, but let's first write down what we know about that circuit. We know that this circuit, because we are using like standard passive elements from the um, electric engineering domain, we can write that as an standard linear ODE, so x dot of t is a times x of t plus some b times u of t, right? So that's straightforward. And our states x of t are i1, i2, and vc, transpose, okay? So i1 is a current through this inductor, I2 is the current through this inductor and Vc is the voltage within this capacitor. So these are our three states of our system. And our measurement Y of T is identical to a measurement vector of 1, 0, 0 times X of T because we assume that we only have access to this input current, right? So that's why we measure the input current, which is here the first state, and the two other state quantities are unknown to us. And for the sake of simplicity, we assume that the initial state x0 is just a zero vector. So basically, we assume that the circuit is not energized at the beginning, and then we connect that circuit to this constant voltage source and we observe how this current, how the circuit responds over time. Okay, so that's basically our approach. So what do we else know? We know of course that we have some parameters which we add up in our parameter P vector and these are the three resistors, R1, R2, R3. We do not know these values and L1, L2, so the characteristic values of the inductors and the capacitance C. So these are our six in total unknown parameters which we want to identify by observing the system response when we connect this non-energized circuit to this constant voltage source. So as usual we can define our standard optimization problem. So we want to minimize the cost function with respect to the parameters P and we will again consider the standard loss, quadratic loss for k, one up to capital N measurement points, y of k minus y hat of k in the two norm or quadratic two norm. And of course, that is subject to our ODE, including the measurement equation, and I will just call this like the star equation here, or the star equations, our state space model, which is basically our simulation model, okay? So that is our task. And let's go through um, finding a solution for this task using the 
M approaches, the parameter identification approaches which we have introduced so far. So for that we can go through this notebook here. Uh, as an introduction we basically see here also the same circuit model as written down here on the light board just for your convenience. And as a starting point of course we need to come up with some baseline um, data. So what we do is we define the true parameters from where we build a baseline model which we would like to identify and if you do the math with the component equations and so on so that's not important how we do that but we can basically come up with this very simple linear state space model of the circuit no big deal okay uh, what we do then is we implement of course as usual the circuit model in uh, an ode problem so we define the circuit equation with three states x1 x2 x3 so these are these as defined, and then with an initial zero condition and a time span simulation from zero seconds to 0.1 second, we generate some baseline um, data by basically just solving the ODE with a step size here of, what is it, I think 0.1 milliseconds. And then we add also, as usual, some measurement noise to it. If you then observe the true uh, baseline response here a little bit let's say uh, an extended view so here in this figure we also get uh, a response of the capacitor voltage and the second inductor um, current however of course in this optimization approach which we will form next we would assume that we will only have access here to the first current which is shown in green while we do not have access to the uh, orange current and to the purple um, voltage response. So what we see here is basically straightforward, uh, some oscillatory behavior because we have multiple energy storages within our system. However, it's also a damped system through uh, the three resistors and we can find that after these 0.1 seconds the system has come into a steady state. Okay, so far so good. However, now remember we will just have access to this greenish um, current response here in order to formulate now our parameter optimization problem. So what we need for that is of course we first need a training model so that's why we uh, implement here a function called circuit train uh, exclamation mark and what you can see here is basically that this gets as an input our parameter vector w and all the six elements of W, so from W1 until W6, these are now our unknown parameters, right? So we basically have again a training function which is depending on these parameters which we want to optimize using a standard optimization solver. For sake of simplicity, our initial guess for W0, assuming that we do not have access to this parameter vector um, using our data-driven knowledge, we just set this to a one vector as an arbitrary guess. Okay, um, then of course we need a cost function. Uh, this cost function looks pretty much as previously. The only big difference what we see here is basically that in the uh, quadratic cost function part, which we formulate here at the very beginning, these two ones which we see here, y of one and x of one, so y is a ground truth data, the noisy ground truth data, and x is a simulation based on our training model from here, that this first argument means that we only consider the current I1 which we can measure here at the terminal at the input of our circuit. So that means that in the quadratic cost function we are not going to consider these two um, states or these two measurements here, right? So that's basically a little bit different than before. Then um, we define here like a helper function, a hyperparameter function P, where we basically have the ODE problem and our ground truth data, but this is basically just nomenclature. And then we use the optimi optimization.jl package in order to solve that. So what do we do is we just formulate again our optimization function with the cost function using uh, out of forward diff and our optimization problem as usual with our initial guess of W0. Okay, what would be then the next step? Of course, we have set up a model, we have ground truth data, we have an initial guess, and we have an optimization problem, so we need to solve the problem. And if we do that, so uh, I have put that into a try-catch formulation here, and within the try uh, element of this try-catch formulation, we have basically the solution of the optimization problem, so basically the execution of this optimization part down here, 
what we can see if, if we execute that, we actually get a big juicy error. And why is that? Why do we get that error? If we would debug that and see how this optimization solver, so we have used here the standard Newton solver, um, approaches the problem, we can basically see that over the iterations of the solver, that some of these parameters get like very weird values. For example, what we can observe is that maybe during one of the iterations, the resistor values become negative, or also the inductor, the inductances may become negative. And if that is the case, so if some of these values become negative um, and um, or might be very large or very small, then the problem is that this ODE problem becomes uh, numerically unstable or also physically unstable giving this parameter vector which is part of the iteration problem. And then the issue is that the underlying ODE solver basically explodes and cannot output uh, a suitable uh, simulation result against which we can compare our ground truth data. So therefore, during this Newton iterations, short story is we get a parameter vector which leads to a numerically unstable ODE problem formulation and we cannot get a cost for that because the ODE cannot be solved. So that's why in this standard formulation we are not able to solve the problem. And that is pretty um, common in that sense that if we have an ill post optimization problem in this parameter identification context that we get also situations where our uh, optimization problem or the underlying ODE solver basically fails. However, of course, we do not want to leave it by this. We want to go further. And what we can do, for example, is we can consider that uh, we have additional knowledge about the system. We have seen, maybe I go a little bit uh, up here in this ground truth data, we have seen that for T approaching larger values that this circuit goes into steady state. If you have basic knowledge about electrical engineering, you can also see that basically. So what is happening that over time when we apply this constant voltage source is basically that this capacitor over time will be loaded at, and at some point it's basically fully loaded, it will not be loaded anymore. So that means there will no current flowing through this branch here in steady state and that means in steady state basically the only current which is flowing is inside this outer loop. So what we can derive from that is some additional pre-knowledge saying that if we have a steady state situation, so if x dot of t is zero, so we have the steady state like here, then we know that the input voltage, if we do this mesh, if we go over this loop, is identical to R1 times I1 plus R2 times I2, right? So that's straightforward. And in steady state, as I said, this capacitor will be fully loaded. It will be also stationary. So that means that I1 and I2 are actually identical because there is no current flowing into this branch, okay? So I1 and I2 in the steady state are actually identical. So what we know is that R1 plus R2 must be V divided by this current I1, which we can measure because I1 and I2 are identical. So that's one pre-knowledge I can implement. Another pre-knowledge I can implement is, of course, if I look at this entire parameter vector, that all of these parameter values, physically speaking, must be positive numbers. So the resistances must be positive, the inductances must be positive, and the capacitor value must be also positive because otherwise that would be an ill post problem in the sense of the physical meaning of the circuitry. So therefore, we do not only have this pre-knowledge which comes from the steady state, but we also have an additional pre-knowledge basically saying that we have some inequality constraints saying that Cj of our parameter vector P, which we optimize here, must be smaller or equal zero. So that would be this condition that none of these parameter values within our parameter um, vector should be negative. And we can also add another constraint, ci hat of p, that this should be zero. So this would be an equality constraint, which basically comes 
from this finding here, from this pre-knowledge which we have basically derived from the topology of the circuit, so that would be in uh, example for an equality constraint, right? So in what we did, by adding this pre-knowledge, we have basically um, transformed our unlimited, our unconstrained optimization problem into a constrained optimization problem which comes from pre-knowledge which we have about the physical system we want to identify. And let's see how this pre-knowledge can help us now to get a better picture of the underlying physical uh, phenomena uh, based on data-driven identification. And I will do this in a two-step two procedure. First, we are going to see what is happening if we just um, introduce the very trivial uh, observation that all of these parameters must be positive. So this would be adding an e uh, inequality um, constraint. And then in a the second step, we will also additionally uh, add this finding that we have an uh, equality constraint, basically saying that R1 plus R2 must be V divided um, E uh, over 1 for the steady state. Okay, let's go through this. Um, so we have seen this issue here already, and now we need to reconfigure our optimization problem using constraints. So first step is, as I said, we will add these so-called box constraints, uh, which we have defined here as equality constraints, inequality constraints, basically meaning that this needs to be positive. So what we do for that is basically uh, very simple. We use again the optimization problem formulation from the optimization package. And what we add here is this LB and this UB, which unfortunately breaks here over the line. But LB is basically the lower bound. And also for sake of completeness, we also need to give up an upper bound. This lower bound is basically now a very small value. So uh, one vector with six elements for the six parameters times 10 to the power of minus six. So this means this must be at least a very small value uh, for every parameter. And then we basically also give an upper bound here with also a one vector times 10, but you could also put in here any higher numbers, doesn't matter. Okay, so we have basically then some simple box constraints, which would be the first part here. In this case, we need to also choose a little different solver here. What we choose instead of the Newton solver, which by its standard formulation is not able to handle any constraints. So what we do is instead we utilize the LBFGS, which is a limited memory um, version of a quasi-Newton approach. And with some tricks, this solver is able to at least consider box constraints as we have implemented here. Okay, with these box constraints, uh, we can basically then solve again our optimization problem and compare the optimization problem against the ground truth parameter. And if we do so, so the first line here are our ground truth parameters and the second line are our found uh, parameter vector. If we utilize only the box constraint on the parameter values, we can basically see that these do not fit together, right? So for example, if we see the, the first true parameter, that would be our resistance R1, the true parameter is 0.5 ohm and the estimated parameter is 10 ohm. So that's basically clipping at the upper limit. So we see that it converges. So we already have somehow a gain here because the optimization problem ran through. We do not run into an error, but the found parameters, they are not really like physically correct. They are far off. We can also see that when we look at the um, response of the simulated system using this estimated parameter uh, vector if we only have the box constraint. And what we can see from that, so the, the dashed lines here are now the lines which we get from the estimated model, from the identified model. And what we can see here is basically that only the uh, greenish dashed line is somehow, not ideally, but somehow following the true behavior, so the solid green line, while the purple and orange dashed lines, they are quite far away, especially the, the, the purple um, pinkish line is also quite far away here from the true uh, voltage response of this capacitor. And why is that? Because we only have this limited access to this input current, which is uh, leading to something like going towards overfitting in that sense. So the optimization solver basically tries everything to 
squeeze the current response through this inductor with our identified model to the true behavior, while the other um, parameters and the system response of the other states are not really physically related because we do not have this, this knowledge yet. Okay, so we have already gained something, but we are quite not still there. So what we do on this last step is now we add also this equality uh, constraint here by our observation which we have obtained from the steady state. So we are also adding now an equality constraint. So by doing that, we have basically seen that we know the DC resistance, so that is R1 and R2 in steady state. If we only uh, give in a direct voltage, we get a direct current response. And we need therefore to implement another constraint. And in Julia we do uh, implement an equality constraint like this by a constraint function. And this constraint function basically has just a, a function which says the first two parameters, so that would be R1 and that would be R2, will come together. And they have to fit some value which we can calculate beforehand by our unsteady state test. Okay? So we therefore implement then this constraint uh, function into our optimization call. And what we can see basically here is that we have added two more functions or two more keyword arguments into our function call, and this is L cons and U cons. And this basically means that is the left um, part, like L cons must be smaller or equal than this part, and U cons must be uh, larger or equal than this part, right? So this would be basically the lower and upper limits. However, as we have set these to the same value in 2.5 is 2.5 ohm, so that's basically R1 and R2, so we have obtained this knowledge via the steady state test. These are the same uh, boundaries, so that uh, basically makes this constraint function an equality constraint. We still have the lower bound and the upper bound constraint. So from our physical interpretation that all these parameters, all the other parameters must be positive. So we did not change that. We just added basically this additional equality constraint that we know, okay, the first resistor plus the second resistor value must be something which I can measure using a steady state test. With that, we still need uh, to optimize that, and now we utilize again another solver, which is an IP Newton variant, so that is also a variant of the Newton solver. However, it has been extended under the hood with some uh, possibilities to also add potentially even nonlinear constraints, which we have used here in a linear way today. Okay, however, these are the details. You can look them up into the optimization.gl package, not really important here to us. Just that you know, okay, we need again another solver variant which is able to operate with these two kinds of constraints. Then we solve this again using the optimization.gl package. And then what we can do is in the last step, we can again compare our found results. And if we do that, we can actually now find that with adding this additional pre-knowledge here, that the found parameters are quite accurate. So all the three resistor values, the two inductor values and the capacitance values are more or less uh, fitting to the true parameter set because we have basically added this constraint. So we have shrinked down the solution space in which the optimization solver can choose optimization results. And apparently by adding this pre-knowledge, by adding this constraining, we have helped the optimization solver to find a result which is actually meaningful to us, okay? So we have basically reduced our optimization space and come up with a fitting result in terms of physical interpretability and also um, correctness. And then the interesting thing is, which I find personally really uh, interesting here, is that although we only have direct access to this first current wire measurement, that with this additional pre-knowledge, what we can see now is that the system response of the identified model is actually lying behind the true noisy ground truth data, although we only had access in this quadratic cost function to I1, why I2 and VC had been unknown to us. So that gives us a notion that implementing such an optimization problem with additional pre-knowledge can definitely help to get results which are more meaningful. And in this case, although we have a much more 
uh, complicated, a much more challenging uh, identification approach than in the previous videos, we have been able to find an optimization result to find a model which is very accurate. Okay, so I hope I could give you some insights here into adding constraints into a data-driven system identification process. And the base information is here basically that this can help us to get first stable results or any results because we prevent that some optimization solver or ODE solver gets unstable. And secondly, it can also help us to get meaningful results which are in line with physical principles of that domain. And this is even not, let's say, so difficult because the pre-knowledge which we have implemented here is on the basis of a first semester bachelor student in electrical engineering. So that is something which you can get out, out of a lecture book within a few minutes. So that really means that the amount of pre-knowledge which we have implemented here is quite reasonable. Okay, so let's see how we can utilize this, let's say, balance of adding data, adding pre-knowledge in the subsequent videos, and especially extend that to cases where we do not have access to the right-hand side of the ODE, right? So here we still assume that we know the topology of the model, right? We assume that we know A and B, and in the subsequent videos we will have in a specific view what is happening if we do not have access to this right-hand side in terms of the topology, right? So if our pre-knowledge we have is limited even more. And we will look into alternatives what we can do then. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.